Having written both comedy and drama, which do you find uh, easier or more enjoyable? And if for the rest of your life you could only do one or the other, <laughs> which would you choose? <laughs> Oh, no, I don't think I could, because I think they're so intrinsically linked. I feel like if there's comedy, if people are laughing, they're kind of giving you their heart a bit. So they're sort of asking you to break it in some way, I think. Because they're, they're it's, I don't know. I just feel like they're, they're, they're too closely entwined. I found it, so during com when I was writing Fleabag and Crashing, I was like, I just want to write a fucking drama. I hate this, like, on the, having to do a tick thing on the page of, like, there's, like, six jokes on this page, and it having to be about generating material and jokes was exhausting. But now I'm writing a drama, I'm like, I just want to put a joke in everything. It's like, it's like, how do I know if it works? Or how do I know? Where's the humanity? I think finding the humanity in drama for me is, is, has been uh, an interesting journey, because I think people being funny or jokes uh, reveal so much so quickly about a character but people staring meaningfully down a corridor um, and then walking with absolutely no sense of humour to go and sign a form. I'm like, <laughs> like what's fun about that? <laughs> but, um, but it's important. So I, I, don't, um, I don't know. There is, there, I ha there's a lot of humour in the drama that I'm writing. So um, uh, I don't know. I think I just have to kill you if you made that, if you made that question. <laughs> I think you've always said as well that drama and um, comedy feel intrinsically linked to you because they're you're vulnerable when you're laughing, and so you can get them, you can spike them with the, mm. with the dramatic thing, but the, the reverse works as well when there's something very dramatic. Relief. You, mm. Yeah, the relief of laughing, and you know, when you, when you want to cry yeah. is a, a sort of an extreme emotional experience. And also the self-awareness of people in real life. Like, you know when you're in a really dramatic argument or something with a boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever, and, you're, and you have an argument, and then there's a little part of your brain that goes, oh my god, we're having a massive argument? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like you kind of see that. I get that in the writing, like, especially with the writing of the drama, like, and everyone's like, <gasps> and all the policemen are like, <gasps> it's like everyone's really dragging. There's always got to be one person who's like, all right, all right. Uh, <laughs> calm down, it's not like it hasn't been done before, you know? People have been murdered before. But also, um, but also but staying ahead, like, not knowing what's going to happen next puts you in a certain state of... Of, um, of absolutely watching, you know, just being glued into it because you, don't, you literally don't know what's going to happen to you next. And that mm. kind of, that is something that I've like, seen you do with audiences so many times. Surprise. Lovely. There was a lady over here, was it? Yeah, on the end. Hi. Hi, I'm Becky from the BBC. I just wanted to say thank you for writing such amazing, complex, funny women on screen. I absolutely loved it. Um, my question was about the release model and the fact that it was one of the first scripted comedies that went out on BBC Three online, um, a new kind of on-demand um, world where you know stuff is available for much longer. Um, did you think that that was part of it, its success in that it was able to kind of grow over a longer period of time? Or do you find that more challenging because you don't have like that linear uh, release pattern where like people are talking about something at the same time every week and that kind of builds up the you know, awareness of it? When, when it was commissioned, BBC Three was still a linear channel. And by the time it was made, mm. it had gone online. I, I didn't, what, do you, what do you think? Did it affect the kind of... I don't know. I don't know what it would have been otherwise. I think there's something really lovely about people finding the show rather than the show. I think when it's linear and it's on TV, you, you interrupt people's lives <laughs> in their living rooms and you go, this is the show. I think there's a sense of it being a found piece for people really helped with that sense of a discovery. And that helped with the word of mouth, I think. People, lots of people were saying, I found this show on my computer. Myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, whereas, um, but I, um, I don't know. It's sort of hard to know what would have... Uh, we what, had a bit of been different. both because it w actually had a weekly release on iPlayer, on BBC Three and onto the iPlayer on, when it first came out. So every week it got a bit of a bump in the kind of reviews and stuff, like the new ones come out. And so there was a bit of that going on at the very beginning, which I think generated some word of mouth. And then it was there, all available. So lots of people I knew chose to wait until it, it, all six were there and then to watch the whole thing. You never had the BBC Two. And then I had the BBC Two TX. Yeah. It's that thing like when The Office, well, every, this is a bit of a cliched one, but when The Office first went out, it was largely ignored and it was when it was repeated. Yeah, yeah. It's that thing that yeah. exactly your thing about if you tell people it's funny, uh, it's like this the show not tell thing. If you ram it down people's throats too much, they go, all right, let me mm -hmm. make my own mind out. Whereas if you discover it, you, it's the cult, you're part of a club. Yeah. Um, 
so I think the iPlayer sort of helps that, doesn't it? I think it did. And I think, weirdly for the tone of the show, there was like a naughtiness about the show that we really wanted, that she is just going, hey, you, come here, come here, come here. And actually, that kind of worked for the online thing, I think, that it felt that it wasn't, that it was its own little corner of the world. But I only watch things that? on iPlayer anyway. So. Yeah. Uh, any, any more? I've probably got time for two more questions. Two more. It's like a terrible auction, there's no one wants to buy. Uh, at that, that, the back. <laughs> Hello. Um, so I was wondering, it's, uh, my question's in terms of structure. Um, and I know you said you had quite a lot of guidance from Lydia when you got to from stage two, uh, structuring it for TV. But um, I just wondered how you tackled that difference. And obviously, you're writing the play, and then that's got a certain structure to it. You transfer that to TV. Um, and the reason I'm asking is because I write scenes, and I think, oh, that's a lovely scene. Yeah. And uh, then I can't put that anywhere or structure into, I mean, yeah. with the risk of the answer being just be Phoebe Waller-Bridge if you want to write an international hit comedy. Um, I just wanted, I'm trying, um, what, how you tackled that kind of difference. Um, God, I was in exactly the same position. You were in scenes, jokes, I have ideas, but they're just fitting them together. I think if you have enough that you can write them on post-its and write them on your wall and just put them together, because I think I've never thought structure first. I've always thought material first, and I think you're the same, aren't you, Vix? And, mm. and it's how we operate so much. Material first, jokes first, character first, and then we just put them all on the wall. Um, and then, honestly, just the game of what if you put this next to this? And usually the more unusual that pairing is of those scenes or those scenes that you put in an episode, the more interesting it, it comes, or that something, something happens when you put two things that should be together. And then you start pulling a story out of that. This is probably really bad advice, because I know you're supposed to structure first, and then you send, send it to your commissioners and go, this is the structure of the episode. And, then, and just send like a screwed up post-it note going, that's out. Um, but um, but that, that really, really helped, was that, was just, just knowing that you're... As long as you're enjoying writing those scenes, then, then once you've got enough, then start playing with it. I think the hook thing at the end that was really helpful, the hook I thing growled about that yeah. at the beginning. <laughs> yeah, that, so the sort of note that came up from BBC was the, the pilot was kind of on purpose meandering and slightly on kind of, what's the words? Not, I guess, un in, not, not very traditional in what you'd expect for like sitcom structure. Uh, and the note came back saying, is there just a way we can make sure we're really hooking the audience for the next episode? And I remember you being like, I'm not writing 24. <laughs> I was like, oh, no. <laughs> but this is the statue. Yes, yeah, so yeah. the statue became like, the, every, it's a tiny thing, but like, Fleabag stealing the statue from Godmother and then trying to, then getting Martin to try and sell it for her and then him giving it to Claire. It just became a way of us making sure that we were just had some, like a little thread that was just running that we kind of were. I remember it was a millstone around your neck for the longest Ooh, time though. She was like, I don't care about Who cares about a statue? So <laughs> boring. a statue? But it ended up being really useful, you didn't do it? Need, yeah. you, do, you do need it. Yeah. yeah. But <laughs> You're right. <laughs> but, um, you knew about the revelation yeah. for Boo as well, didn't you? you... The, but yes, knowing the end really, really helps. Yeah. Um, and then you know, you should just go far away from the end emotionally as you possibly can. That's my instinct anyway. And, I think knowing how you, and when we were doing our dry write stuff, theatre stuff um, early on, a lot of our experiments were how do you want to make the audience feel? Like, what is the journey, emotional journey you want them to go on? And that really helps me rather than thinking, like, starting off thinking, like, this would work A story, B story, C story. It's, it's at this point, if you found a moment, a scene that you know works and is going to make them feel, you need to hit them with it as a surprise. So then work away from that. And, it's very instinctual. Sorry, was that at all helpful? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> We've got one more. Any, anyone fancy rounding us off? No. <laughs> we were complete. Um, so, in conclusion, how you make an international hit, <laughs> otherwise they're going to want their money back, um, how you make an international hit is uh, find kindreds. Well, f firstly, deal with the disillusion of, of, of uh, whoever fucked that play up. Uh, <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> find kindreds. Um, what, just, you know, grow things, grow test things live, find that world. And when it comes to TV, don't compromise it in any way, shape or form. Seems to be the, th the thing. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh. In the end. Yeah, not compromising is a big one for you, isn't it? I, I, yeah. Yeah, I think even though you're so lovely, you know what you want. And I think you... You stick to that, and 
I think if you feel really, really, really sure about something, then really fight for it. Because often I think yeah. people are asking questions because they're feeling their way around what you're trying to make. And so, I don't, I don't know, tell me if I'm wrong here, but with notes and things, mm. it's not always that people want you to change it completely, but if you're... The mo if you come back fighting, they're like, whoa, fine, fine, as long as you know what you're doing, yeah. as, long as, you know, as long as you know, then it's fine. And I think that's, that is that. It's yeah, notes can identifying feel like... what you feel sure about and then just yeah. following that. Notes can feel like a mandate, but then, you know, if they, you see them as help. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah they're questions, really. I yeah. Think. yeah. Pointers. Hmm. Um, and you've got to work hard, right, guys? Yeah? <sighs> Yeah. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. That's why it's taken two years. Yeah, Cheers. talking Cheers. things over and over Talk and over. I remember that. Out loud. Finding someone, I mean, finding someone you can work with is a huge, huge thing. And Drink with. Yeah. Drink with, yeah. Drink and with actually, them. that's really important. A lot of flea bag was done with half a bottle of wine <laughs> down yeah. already because you work all day in the rehearsal room or developing stuff and you're, you're so up against it and you're like, this has to be. This is a professional, and I have to come up with this, and we won't get anything done. And then it's the half hour in the pub afterwards when yeah. all those ideas, your brain relaxes, and then your, all the ideas come. So yeah. allow yeah. yourself that. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank, thank you so much for um, an amazing experience. It's a phenomenon. We can't wait for a second series. I want to thank Chris Sussman for putting this all together. Yeah. I want to, and the sponsor is the BBC, so thank you to me for that. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Um, but let's hear it for uh, Phoebe, thank you. Vicky, and Lydia.